Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another special episode of Talk is Turkestan. I have a very special guest with me. Um, as you've seen in the ad, I've got Mr. James Palmer, who is uh, a deputy editor at Foreign Policy. Uh, James is the author of The Bloody White Baron, the extraordinary story of the Russian nobleman who became the last Khan of Mongolia and the death of Mao, uh, the Tangshan earthquake and the birth of the new China. He won the Shiva Nepal Prize for travel writing in 2003. So um, he's very much, he's a journalist essentially, uh, very much familiar with, with the goings on of what happens in the Uyghur region. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome him to our podcast. Aslan, thank you for having me. Nice to have you as well. Can you hear me okay? Yep, everything's very clear. Excellent, excellent. So we're just going to get straight into it. Um, I basically today wanted to touch on the journalist side of things. Um, and basically, as we all know, China in general, but particularly the Uyghur region, as well as other regions such as Southern Mongolia or Tibet, are some of the most difficult places to do journalism in the world. Now, James, could you speak to what to what it was or is like being a journalist in the Uyghur region? Sure. So I, I should add, first of all, that I don't have a lot of experience reporting directly from Xinjiang myself. Um, I was mostly familiar with the Uyghur diaspora in um, uh, East China and elsewhere, though I've, I've spent a little time there. And of course, I've worked with a lot of journalists who have reported from there as an editor. So, you know, until, um, so for a long time, of course, um, the problems were not significantly greater than reporting from elsewhere in China because of the, because of the nature of these regions, you know, Tibet, uh, Xinjiang and um, Inner Mongolia as uh, borderlands regions, as securitized regions, there were, you were more likely to be followed or harassed by security forces. Uh, but things were not completely closed. And then since, you know, 2013, 2014, we've seen a gradual shutdown of these areas um, until uh, stuff has become increasingly difficult. Um, it, uh, you're, you're monitored virtually from the moment you enter the region as a, a foreigner. The, um, people you talk to are very likely to be arrested and are very aware of uh, the limits and what's being said. Um, I've known I've known people who have been, um, uh, in fact, Han Chinese uh, in this case, who have been arrested by the police literally in the middle of talking to a foreigner. Um, that's most acute in Xinjiang. It's uh, less acute in Tibet and uh, particularly in Inner Mongolia, but still, still it's much worse than it has been. And so we've come increasingly, um, when covering these regions, to look to um, other sources of information beyond direct on the ground reporting. Uh, one big reason, of course, being that this direct on the ground reporting runs severe risks for anybody we talk to. Um, and, you know, you have to be like considerate of that, like even the action of speaking to somebody as a foreigner may be enough to get them on these networks that have uh, sent people to the camps, sent people to prison and so on. Um, even, if, even, if, even if what they say is, you know, follows the government line or is innocuous, the risk is still there. Uh, calling people, speaking to people on WeChat, speaking to people or, um, through other uh, communications methods can also be risky because, of course, we've, we've seen people arrested 
uh, for the act of having unapproved apps on their phone, uh, for using VPNs and so on, um, these methods that are often used to reach foreign journalists. So increasingly, we're looking at you know open source data, um, looking at the information that the Chinese state itself uh, has put online as part of um, the digitization of the government. We're lo and we're looking, of course, to speak to members of the diaspora and people who have managed to escape the region um, and made it elsewhere and also you know through the networks of information that are smuggled out through various means uh, within uh, the Uyghur and other communities. Now I understand I saw a documentary of you I think it was at least a year ago where you were making an emotional plea saying that you no longer had contact with certain individuals and most likely they had ended up in the camps or worse had even died. Um, those well, individuals case, were, yeah I, I think it, I'm not certain that it I, I'm not certain that they're in the camps. There are a couple of people who I think are. Um, what yeah. I know is that they cut off contact with me because the the risk of answering or the risk of being in contact was too high. Um, and uh, I can't I can't say beyond that. Of course, I'm afraid that, that that some of them have been have been sent to the camps or other forms of the detention. Yeah. So when China goes, simply come and visit and have a look for yourself. That's that's not a reality. That can't be true, can it? Even fettered access. So when we hear, or when, especially like myself, we're constantly calling for unfettered access, and were that to be granted, and you are allowed in, where would you look? I mean, how would you conduct that investigation? And what do you look for, even if you were given fettered access? What are the telltale signs with something that something deeper is going on below the surface? So, I mean, you know, unfettered access basically can't exist in the Chinese system as, const as constituted. Like it's an hmm. it's an impossibility. You know, you're always going to be monitored. You're always going to be guided. People, even if it's you know, you can come and you can go anywhere. Um, the the uh, people will be cleared out of sites. People will. Be, um, people are living in an atmosphere of fear that means they can't talk or these kind of things so in these kind of situations what you're look what you're looking for and it's a balance between you know some people will try and do the things that for instance some journalists do in North Korea where they try to get away from the minders and uh, and go and, and find people independently in the hope that somehow people will spill their hearts out to this random foreigner um, I think that's a risky and often an unethical move because of the risk that you're, you're Again, because of the risks that you're putting people in, um, just by being part, uh, like by by making contact with them in, in those situations. Um, and so, what you're looking for, what reporters are looking for, a thing um, are, for instance, um, things like demolished sites, rebuilt um, uh, rebuilt sites, signs of securitization, of ple of increased police presence, um, of um, security cam. Oops, security cameras, uh, what checkpoints, um, armed guards, all these kind of things that indicate the level the crackdown has reached. Um, sometimes sometimes just the amount of securitization that the reporter faces can be a useful bit of information. Like there was a, a real difference between going to Xinjiang in 2007 and going to Xinjiang in 2017, for instance. Mm. Um, and then there's a, a you know, a, a, you you can if you're very experienced in the region there are other cultural signs that you can look for um things that you know um things that have disappeared that represent the culture um but, uh i mean one of the very obvious signs that something very bad was happening from in even in the rest of china was simply the disappearance of uyghur vendors from the streets like uh, the uyghur diaspora was once a major presence you know um um on, on the streets of uh, uh, Eastern Chinese cities, and that's and they vanished. Like they were forced back on mass um, uh, after the, in particular, after the Kunming attack, and that was a, a real sign that something you know bad was beginning to happen. I mean, there were lots of signs before that, of course, but um, that was a, for me one of the big indicators. Um, and, but you can look to for um, you know the performative patriotism, like the degree to which people are forced to display symbols of the Chinese state in order to um, in order to ensure that they're not singled out as being disloyal. And while that's the case throughout China, to some degree, it's particularly acute for minorities, dissidents, anybody who's in a position where they might be swept up in these sort of paranoid campaigns. Um, 
Yeah, that was very good. Um, because there isn't that unfettered access, what we seem to be seeing is that um, the government is setting out these Western YouTubers on tours, um, enlightening the world on what is going on. It's as though if they, if they get, I mean, I don't need to sound crude, but if they get white people to say everything's okay, then it gives it a sort of legitimacy. How do you react to those poorly made propaganda videos made by what people refer to as white monkeys? And more broadly, could you speak to how the media works in China, that there are no independent news outlets from the, you know, separate from the government? Sure. So first of all, on the Western YouTubers, of course, this is a propaganda strategy going back, you know, to the early Soviet Union, um, when you had uh, figures like the like the Webs who were um, West who were Western socialists who were given Potemkin tours and wrote, you know, the Soviet Union, a new civilization. Um, or Walter Durante reporting from uh, Ukraine in uh, 1929, 1930, um, not so on the date there, but so don't quote me, uh, on where he covered up, where he deliberately covered up the uh, Soviet, the Soviet famine, um, be because he was ideologically in support of the, the communists. And now, you know, a lot of these YouTube figures, the sad truth of it is they're not even ideologically driven, they're just utterly corrupt, that just being paid off, um, which is, a, a you know, to sell your soul because you have a craft beer business in Shenzhen, you know, is a pretty pathetic thing, frankly. And whereas in the 1920s, you know, in, in the 1920s, the Soviet Union was able to get the support of major intellectual figures because the appeal of, like, state communism was still there, you know, now the best they can do is, like, friendly Geordies. I mean, this is a, a law, this is a big come down uh, in many ways. And there is that kind of like um, desire to uh, whitewash it, as it were, the belief that it, like if you have a, a a white face presenting it, it it will be more credible to to foreigners. But I don't think the I, I don't think this really has a lot of reach. I think most people who aren't, you know, for one reason, like already ideologically committed to the idea that the Chinese government is wonderful, I don't think they believe or fall for this kind of. Um, Thing. It's very, you know, it's a gross insult to Uyghur. It's a incredibly racist, nasty pieces of work, but um, it's not, I think, that effective. I think a lot of the propaganda within the Muslim world has been more effective. A lot of the way, um, a lot of the uh, reach out um, in, you know, Central Asia, Indonesia, uh, the Middle East, and so on, has been um, because that's backed by the governments there, because that's backed by a lot of media there, because there's an under, there's an understandable narrative among. Um, some Muslims worldwide that the United States um, is uh, the the oppressive power rather than China, and so they don't believe, and so there's a tendency to um, favor China or believe China. But look at Pakistan, of course, a long-term ally, um, and so um, I don't think that's fully effective. I think obviously that we've seen a lot of uh, solidarity among um, among the Muslim world, particularly at the popular level, with Uyghur, but uh, it's. That some of that propaganda has been a, a effective. As to media in China as a whole, I think you know there's there's never been a truly independent media. There's never been um, that from the 1980s onwards. There have been lots of outlets that have attempted to work and journalists that have attempted to do honest reporting in China. Chinese journalists, China, it's a uh, um, media outlets that have tried to push the envelope, like Southern Weekend back in the day. Um, um, but they, they're still ultimately vulnerable, vulnerable to censorship, control, like able to be stomped down in a moment. And, and under Xi, we've seen increasingly that's moved from the old system, which was um, a lot of it was kind of post facto censorship. So a lot of imposition, so a lot of punishment if you went out of line, but the, some possibility to report or to get things out beforehand. Um, to a much more proactive system of censorship and control, where um, even in normally private outlets, a lot of what's being said is straight from um, is straight from the government copy. One way you can measure that is to look at the um, degree of the degree that newspapers use material directly from Xinhua, the uh, official Chinese state news agency. The more Xinhua copy they're using, the more politically nervous they are because they don't want to risk going, like making us even a small mistake. So, um, and one of the other problems is that there have always been red line issues, issues on which reporting is 
exceptionally dangerous, and so people avoid it um, or stick very closely to the government line. So traditionally, that was more concentrated on Taiwan and Tibet, and there was actually a little bit, for a while, there was a little bit more space, even, I would say, in, in Xinjiang. You had, you know, Chinese, Chinese papers were talking about, for instance, the fact that um, Uyghur people could not, or even Han people with, uh, with Uyghur ID, with uh, Xinjiang ID cards, weren't able to get hotel rooms, faced racism, and so on throughout the country that was being discussed in the um, in the media to some degree around between around uh, 2009 and 2011 in particular. But we've seen a massive hardening of that, a massive creation of a new red light around Xinjiang, and this need to constantly defend, you know, to claim that there's no genocide, to claim that there's no atrocities, to push forward the government line. That demand on Chinese media has become far stronger. And so media outlets that want to um, that don't want to be embroiled in that um, tend simply to avoid talking about it altogether but we're seeing more and more this this demand from the top for positive propaganda that people have to the people have to um, take part in the propaganda have to endorse the atrocities or the idea that no atrocities are happening we see that not only in media but in in business of course with things like the cotton campaign Oh, you've gone silent. Um, Sorry. I'll just get a question from one of our listeners. Um, they've written, do you think the BRI or the Belt and, Road, uh, Belt and Road Initiative is the main driver of the current oppression? So this is an idea that I've seen going around before, and of course it refers to the original conception of the Belt and Road before. So nowadays the Belt and Road is this kind of sprawling, all-encompassing, basically anything in China's foreign policy, foreign investment can be described as Belt and Road. It's very messy. Not very effective. The original concept was that you had um, a Belt and Road, which were sea and land connectivity between um, China and Europe, and of course Xinjiang, East Turkestan, uh, sits directly on that on that route. Um, on mm -hmm. on in fact the the belt, the road. Rather confusingly, the road is the sea route, and the belt yeah. is the land route. Um, and. While I think it's while I think that you know desire for resources, desire for securitization of, of an important route is part of it, I don't think it's the main driver. I think the main because the, the driver is this increased ethno nationalism across Chi across the Chinese system as a result of Shiism. Um, the reversal which was going on even between before the BRI. The reversal of the previous policy, which invi which was the Soviet policy, at least nominally, that envisaged separate cultural and linguistic lives for minorities um, within the framework of a communist system, but at least nominally um, being able to preserve their own culture and so on, that switched towards pure, pure assimilationism. And most of all, the um, growing spiral of, of violence um, in that created the idea that the that the Uyghur, particularly young Uyghur, young Uyghur men, were inherently a problem that had to be securitized and eliminated. Um, you touched on this just a moment ago. Um, the US has been at the forefront in raising the plight of the Uyghurs, first to label it a genocide, first to sanction CCP officials. Um, the other day you tweeted, and this is pretty, pretty much sums up a lot of China's argument against the Uyghur genocide, is that you tweeted, I never understand the arguments that uh, the US did the wrong thing in the past, therefore doing the right thing now would be wrong. Could you add to this? I mean, I, I totally agree with you, but could you just add to this and how China is using this sure. again? So, yeah. you know, one, one of the things that we've seen actually um, since even the Armenian genocide is people saying, yeah. well, the, um, the United States committed genocide against Native Americans, so how can they, how can they criticize anybody else? Um, and now it's true, the United States did commit genocide against Native Americans, um, and many of the things that we see in the US in the 19th century um, are reminiscent of uh, conditions on the ground for Uyghur today, like Indian schools, the removal of an entire generation, and the attempt to forcibly destroy the culture. But the difference is that the United States, um, A, doesn't do that anymore, B, um, broadly recognizes, though there are obviously exceptions, such as the Republican, much of the Republican Party, that this was a wrong and a terrible thing that the country did. Um, and and, and that, that this allows some kind of, um, uh, and is, is horrified by the idea that the, these things should occur again, in the same way as, as the Germans, for instance, um, 
obviously um, committed uh, uh, one of the perpetrators of one of the worst genocides in the world um, feel that they have some kind of mission um, to ensure that this doesn't happen again when they're not trying to sell cars to China, of course. That, that seems to override um, that mission, unfortunately. Um, but this idea, but you know, since the Armenian genocide, the Tur people have used the idea that because a country did something bad in the past, it can't criticize it today. And I'm like, well, A, this is a ridiculous idea. All countries have committed atrocities in the past. B, um, even if even if it, it, even if we accepted it as hypocritical, it wouldn't doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean that it, 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 this isn't actually a defense saying, well, you did a genocide now, so we get to you did a genocide then, so we get to do a genocide now. Isn't actually a a serious defense it's just it's a whoa well, there we go um my cat has been uh, my cat has been attacking the screen for the last few minutes uh, right. in the background he likes to, to claw it um that's okay it, it brings excitement to the podcast i know it's a little drama you get to see like the shaking be yeah. behind and there's actually an, a ministry of state security agent just behind there listening um yeah but the <laughs> the um um Hi, buddy. And now the dog has come over to because he's jealous of the attention the cat has gotten. So, um, so you have so you know this is a, a, a when you think through it morally, logically, this is a ridiculous this is a ridiculous idea. Um, but it's not um, uh, it's one that's very common as a defense. You know, the Chinese the Chinese argument is the sort of multi layer thing of we're not doing it. Everything is fine, and even if we were doing it, you did it, and even if we and even if we are doing it, we're doing it for good reason, you know. And so, the, so you'll get because a lot of this stuff is stuff that is openly admitted by the Chinese state, the re-edu the re-education camps, the placement of people in Uyghur homes, except that it it's portrayed as justified out of the need to, you know, supposedly civilize or securitize um, the uh, an entire people. And we can very clearly recognize this as the as the logic of colonialism, as the logic of imperialism. Um, but the imperial, but uh, within China, of course, this is seen as perfectly normal and acceptable. And so a lot of the information we're getting is stuff that the Chinese are putting out themselves internally because they portray it as entirely good and righteous to, for instance, stick um, stick a million people in Uyghur homes. In your mind, what do you think is the end goal uh, for the Uyghurs? Uh, you know, what's the end goal of Chinese government? I think it's to destroy the Uyghur as a people. So it's not to mm -hmm. physically annihilate them, though of course the campaign has no doubt come with many with many deaths from whether uh, from torture, from brutality, from sickness or deprivation. A lot of elderly people have been put in the camps um, and in bad conditions. But I don't think that physical annihilation is the chief purpose. I think they basically want to lock away um, or coerce an entire generation that they see as um, fundamentally poisoned against. Chinese rule to indoctrinate to the next generation and possibly to even split up the people physically um, so that the sense of a coherent community is destroyed, certainly to destroy the idea of any kind of inheritance or culture or history. That's why we've seen, for instance, people who were part of people who were part of the party state, people who were um, <laughs> people who were um, involved in writing textbooks for the Chinese state in the 2000s, being, uh, con being condemned by the Chinese state, being, claiming that these were, you know, two-faced people, people who were actually creating separatist textbooks all along for what were, was simply the portrayal of a Uyghur existence and a Uyghur culture in the past. And so I think the end goal is to destroy that culture, to destroy the sense of the, of the Uyghur as a people, and to, and to force assimilation on a, a broad scale. It's the same dream, the same vision that um, colonialist, country, colonialist countries have had in a lot of cases. Um, think of, again, going to the U US, the 19th century idea of, you know, kill the Indian and save the man. Um, it's, it's, the, it's, the same, it's the, the same idea when it comes to the, the up and coming generation. I think for the current generation, they recognize that that's an impossibility. And so it's simply the imposition of a climate of total fear that prevents, that, that breaks up the culture, um, prevents uh, any, as they see it, security risk and um, and and uh, destroys the, the civil society foundations of Uyghur life. Okay, solution-wise, um, what do you think is going to work? Because we've got 
you know, countries and parliaments labeling it a genocide, you know, economic sanctions on certain individuals, the main perpetrators, so to speak, um, not doing much. What do you think would be something that, and we're even awarding them with um, an, a Winter Olympics next year, sending the message that it's okay to oppress people and you're still going to be able to host these humanely events. Um, how are we going to solve this? So I think we have to be realistic about what the uh, what the like immediate goal is, and I would say the immediate goal is to get the Chinese government to back off the worst of the crackdown. Um, they're obviously not going and um, and uh, to uh, allow many more Uyghur to leave. I think that's going to be unfortunately key. I don't I don't see there being a realistic prospect of you know any kind of independence or increased autonomy for for Uyghur life in the Uyghur homeland. Um, but I think we can get it to something like the 1970s with Jews and the Soviet Union, when the jackson vanek Amendment um, uh, basically uh, enabled, uh, put pressure and incentives on the Soviet Union to allow large numbers of, of, of Jews out to emigrate to Israel or the United States um, in return for, uh, in return for um, the lifting of trade sanctions and similar methods. So I think this is probably only realistically doable when uh, when she is ousted or dies, um, because when Xi Jinping is ousted or dies, because I think the system has committed itself too deeply. I think that there's actually a lot of people within the system who think that things have gone too far, who realize the dangers of the of the extreme route that they've gone down. Not some some of them out of moral reasons. Some of them out, some of them because they're genuinely horrified. Some of them out of simple pragmatic reasons, seeing the PR disaster that this has created for China worldwide. But I think that they will only have the space to act. Once the once she goes, um, and who knows when that will be, but once but once that happens, I think that there will be an, some ability to back off um, in the same way as the Chinese state has backed off previous um, atrocities like the Cultural Revolution um, or the Maoist era as a, a whole to issue limit. There, will, there may even be the possibility for limited apologies and recompense to some of the people affected, though that may be a stretch. Um, and certainly there'll be the possibility of, of loosening things up in, to, in a way that allows the um, uh, allows people out, allows people um, allows the diaspora to reunite with their families. I think that that's a I think that that's an achievable goal. Like I think it, it's doable. It's going to be very tough, but I think that that should be the the like end state right of the the end state for now that we're looking towards when we try and put pressure on on China. Well, thank you so much for your insights today, um, James. Uh, make sure, guys, you can follow James on um, at Beijing Palmer on Twitter and also follow uh, at Foreign Policy. He's a deputy um, uh, director there. Um, are there any final words you'd like to share with us before I let you go, James? You know, just again, to, as always, try and express my sol solidarity with the community. It's one that's become very uh, dear to me over the, the past few years and where I'm always very touched by people's like generosity by their bravery and by their endurance and solidarity. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to say goodbye to you off screen as well. So I'm going to close out the show. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much to all the listeners. Make sure you guys share, uh, like, and subscribe to our channel and get, get it out there. Um, and until next time, everybody, peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Biz gelermez sap sap bulur